Praise God. My name is Patience Maigua, and today's reading will be is from the book of Exodus, chapter one, verses one to two to twenty-two. Sorry, and on our church Bible is page forty-two. And I read, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with the household, Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, Isaac, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtal, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70, 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful, fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now they arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many to, and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Let's, let them multiply. And if the war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they said taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And, and the Egyptians were, sorry, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruth, ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slave and made their bitter life with hard service in mortar and bricks and in all kind of work in the in the field in their all in sorry in all their work and they ruthlessly made them work as slaves then the king of egypt said to the hebrew midwife one of whom was named shipra and the other puha when they served as midwife to the hebrew women and see them on the birth stool if it is a son you shall kill him but if it's a daughter she shall live but the midwife feared god and did not do as the king of the Egypt commanded, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt came. So the king of Egypt called the midwife and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male ch children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are too are not like the Egypt Egyptian Egyptian women's free, for they are vigorous and give birth for the before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with them. So God dealt with the midwife, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And the people, and and because the mid the midwife feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that, that is born to Hebrew you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. It's a huge joy to see all of you uh, this morning. Uh, come over so that we can be able to fellowship with one another and to be able to grow uh, in our faith. That, that's the theme for this year. That's what we are longing for. We'll be able to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, grow in our faith. And, and I think the words of Ephesians that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. My name is Peter Amau. I'm one of the elders here, and it's my joy to be serving and to be shepherding among you people. I'm married to Rose, who is at the crash. Somebody said on Sunday, I always say my wife is at the crash. Uh, I think she has remained there. I hope she will come out one day. But it is true she is there. Uh, the reason why she is there is because we have uh, a young uh, daughter uh, who is only 11 months old. And so she, I think she loves staying there at the crash. Um, now, when you know, we have two children, Ezra, um, uh, who is a bit older, I think has gone to Sunday school. And I remember when the children came, we were enjoying our marriage until children came. <laughs> Perhaps those who, have, uh, those who have children might understand me. Those who are expecting grace upon grace to you. <laughs> Uh, we were really enjoying our home. Until now, we don't have our space any longer. Um, and we praise the Lord for his grace that he has continued to hold us strong. Amen? And uh, up to this very day. So when uh, we are thinking, and we were thinking with uh, Pastor Patrick on what should we think about couples 
um, sort of lunch out what would be the best thing to discuss without perhaps what has been our own very experience, which is not strange to many of us, is what would be the best thing for us to ask and to tell the couples. So on 12, we have organized a very good uh, uh, sort of out for couples. And one of the main things that this, the speaker for the day will be addressing is how Lire, uh, in the midst of children coming to marriage, how can we be able to still remain loving one another and growing in God? Because that's a huge thing, isn't it? Huge, huge thing. And I think we praise the Lord that in this church we have been blessed to have so many young couples who are coming on board. And we pray that the Lord will help us to be able to minister to each one of you. But I cannot think of a better thing to discuss than that. I think sometimes that's where most marriages start breaking there. As you even start already disagreeing on the names of the children. And by the way, today I'll be mentioning good names in case those of you who are expecting a disagree. There is Pua. Do you hear that name? <laughs> there, is, uh, there is Pua and Shipira. So good names here. So don't disagree. After this, see me and I'll commission one of the names uh, to be able to give to you. But anyway, it's a huge thing, is it? I don't want to make a fun out of it. It's a huge, huge thing that can actually be able to plague us. Now, if you're new and you're wondering about Grace Point, we... We long, we pray that we'll be able to preach the gospel uh, from the scriptures. We say we are Bible-centered, which is one of the reasons why we provide Bibles on the pew uh, so that members can be able to follow uh, whatever we are saying here. And we long that we will be instructed in the word of God, but also that that word of God will have an impact in the way we live, the way we do life, the way we even do parenting for those who are parenting, the way we even live as single people uh, for those who are single. That's really our longing and our desire. And in fact, we want, not only for the adults, but even your own children who have gone to Sunday school, we can assure you that whatever they are hearing is nothing else by the gospel. So that's who we are, and that's how we want to continue really feeding on the gospel. So from this year, this is a big series that we are going through. It's called The Great Rescue. We're going to be looking at a good chunk of Exodus. I may not go up to the very end. Perhaps we might only get up to halfway but this is what we want to, to really continue looking at as we look at the big rescue of the children of Israel uh, from their slavery in Egypt all the way up to Canaan. That's what we are going to be studying and also trying to do a lot of lessons uh, for us. So if you're new again, you're wondering where are we, what are we doing this, uh, this is where we are. So can I encourage you then on the passage that has been led to us by patience on Exodus, which is on page 42, please do keep your Bibles open uh, because I intend to stay on that particular passage. Now, as we start, uh, why don't I, don't I pray for you and myself that the Lord will help us, especially as we come to his word, that we'll be able to grasp it, we'll be able to respond to these beautiful words that we have just sung about. We'll be able to respond in humility, in openness, that Lord, we may be saying, Lord, here I am. Please, would you speak to me? Now, I say this because I, I sometimes attend services just for the sake of it. Sometimes I have attended sermons and have just listened to them, can I plead to God that he will, he will speak to me today, he will speak to all of you who are here today, uh, that he will do that which is his will. Now we are looking at the Old Testament, and Paul, writing in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, he says, for whatever was written, when he's alluding to the Old Testament, in earlier times, was written for our instruction, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope and overflow with confidence in his promises. Lord, we pray that this will be true of us today. That we indeed, as we hear these instructions and what was written before, as we read this story of the great rescue of the children of Israel from Egypt. We pray that through them, we may have the encouragement, we may have hope, and we may overflow with confidence in your promises. We pray that especially that we may know you, whom we have believed, the promises you have given to us, and that we would cling to your promises in all seasons. And Lord, please, Help that through the text ahead of us, please would you illuminate and help us to know you, to find encouragement and that hope to keep on waiting at the second coming 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please grant today as a church that we will be awakened to a greater passion for you and your kingdom. That even the present hardship will give us all the more reason to guess at Jesus Christ. That our daily anxieties will give way to trusting upon you who is dependable and who can be trusted. Lord, help me, Jesus, this morning. With all my weaknesses, Lord, I pray that they will not stand in the way of you speaking to your people, but that God, I pray that even as you speak to your people this morning, please, would you also speak to me as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, um, I sometimes find myself tempted in the morning to say a lot than I should. I'm always trying to resist that temptation. But I just thought, because we are doing the Old Testament, which is a part of the Bible, but I find it that it is not that easy to read and to understand the Old Testament. And perhaps some of you find that. When you're reading in your morning, perhaps devotion, you have a couple of chapters. Like the one now we are encouraging the whole church family to read the Bible in a year. You are finding yourself in Nehemiah, in Genesis, Exodus, and you're trying to make sense sometimes of what is this word of God saying to me today. And I thought, a quick one here. As we read the Old Testament, normally a huge chunk of it is narrative or stories. And what we see in the Old Testament, we see God dealing with his people, like the way we are going to be seen here. And it is from that, the way God is dealing with his people, that we learn about who God is. Is he a holy God? Is he a mighty God? Is he a savior? Is he God who is Jehovah Jireh, the provider of his book? Those are some of the things we are trying to learn when we are opening the Old Testament. It's not necessarily a copy and paste because he, you know, Moses was told to hit the rock. I should also go outside there and hit the rock. Not necessarily. But we are learning how God is dealing with the people. And we are also learning how his people are responding to God when he is dealing with them. But can I also say, as we learn those small stories, the story of people being rescued here, stories of, of, of David and Goliath, story of, of Samuel, and David, all these kind of stories, the other big thing to be asking yourself is how each of those stories fits to the big story we talked about last Sunday, that one of redemption. We say that the summary of, of the Bible story is, is a story of salvation. It's God who is redeeming his people. So it's one big story of the Bible. It's not small stories that don't make sense together. So no story in the Bible is random, but all of them are working together to make one big story of salvation. Is that helpful? So when I was uh, beginning to, to read the Bible, somebody helped me a lot. He told me, if Kamau, you are confused in the morning and you're reading Genesis and you're asking, how do I make sense of this one? He said, you can ask yourself three questions, which are very easy. It's just very basic. He says, you can ask yourself of any passage, what is this passage teaching me about God? What is it teaching me about man or humanity? And therefore, how should I respond? Is that easy? What is this story teaching me about God, about man or humanity? And therefore, how should I respond to that? Now, why is that important? It's very important as we think about what we want this year to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways of growing the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we said, is on feasting of his, on his word. And so it is very important then for us to know, as I read that word, how should I understand that word? So that we don't find ourselves either caught up uh, in things that we are reading, and sometimes we may not be able to make a lot of point on how it is. Perhaps some of us might already be having that information, but perhaps some of us might need a benefit uh, from that. And it also might help you to know why, and to understand why I would approach Exodus the way I'm approaching uh, this particular great rescue. A story. Salvation is a promise. We now go to the story of today. I'm, I'm away with my Bible 101, uh, uh, how to read it. Salvation is a promise. 
It is a promise that God has given to us that we will spend eternity with him, that he has forgiven us our sins when we have come to him and we have believed him, that Christ indeed is our redeemer. He died on the cross for us. That's, that's a promise that the gospel gives to us. And today, as we are here, none of us was there when Jesus Christ was being crucified. Is it? None of us has seen him. But we believe. What do we believe? We believe a promise that he has promised us. We believe that as we come to him and we seek for forgiveness, surely we find forgiveness in him. It is also a promise that, hey, like we saw last Sunday, even beyond death, I can be assured, I can rest assured, I can tell people to put a cross on my grave. Because I know that one day I shall be with Christ in eternity. That is, that is a gospel hope. But the question I want us to look at this morning is, why should we trust God? Why should we put our hope in God? Well, you might say, I think I have seen him, you know, helping me. Things have been nice in my home. I have really succeeded in life. But really, what about when storms are raging? Or when things are not as we hoped them to be? Can we still trust him? What assurance do we have? Or is it gatherings of the church? Is it a wishful thinking on Sundays? Now, what we're going to look at today is very important. It is a story of how God has fulfilled a promise he made to his people. And that is what gives us assurance today that we can be able to trust him. You ask me, come out, what assurance can we go home with today? Well, I'll say, we look back to what he has done, and we say, he did it, he will do it. That's how it works. He promised, he fulfilled, he promised, he will do it. So where do we start? So we go back to look at the promise that he has made. In the scriptures. And we are in the book, the second book of the Bible, Exodus. Where do we go back to? Genesis. Great. We go back to Genesis and we look at what God had promised. And we come back to Exodus to look, has he fulfilled that particular promise? So if you allow me, please, just flip your Bibles back. Because this is important. I want us to read it together. Into Genesis 22. And verses 15 to 18. Genesis 22. Is where we're going to read. It's a very famous story, but I will not read the whole of it. I want us just to read the, the last, almost the last portion. It's the story of Abraham sacrificing his only son, Isaac. It's a very a wonderful story. Perhaps in the future, the Lord will help us to revisit that story. God calls one man, Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, and he gives him lots of promises. And Abraham walks with God. And at this particular time, he even asks Abraham to do a greater thing. He asks him to sacrifice his own son, Isaac, which, to our great surprise, Abraham is ready to do. He goes to the mountain, with his son, he's ready to do it. But of course, that famous passage, the Lord provided a lamb instead of Isaac. And so Isaac was not sacrificed. And as God responds to that, from verses 15 to 18, is where we hear these words of God who is coming into covenant or making a promise to Abraham. So here is a promise that has been made to Abraham. And let's, I just want us, the whole church, for us to read that promise because it's is what we are going to consider uh, this morning as we look at its fulfillment. So are you there on page 15? Page 15, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. So one, two, we go. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven 
and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. That's a promise that he makes to Abraham. Huge promise that he will surely, verse 17, bless him. He will multiply his offspring. I think currently Abraham has only one, one child by the name Isaac. And in fact, he says there, quite almost unbelievable, that I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as a sand that is on the... I'm avoiding to say that because you know where I come from, eh? But it's the sand on the sea shore, okay? May the Lord have mercy on me. Now, but that's a big, that's a big thing. If, you, if you're thinking about it, I will not just give you 10 or 15 people, not 100 people, but I will give you many descendants I think, in short, that you cannot even be able to count. That's the whole point, is it? You cannot be able to count all the stars that are in heaven. So God calls one man, great promises, one that would seem very ridiculous. And by the way, before that, Abraham was even aged and had no children. But what is God promising? A nation. Many descendants, like stars, like the sun. By that time, Abraham was living only in a small piece of land, actually, which was not even his. And God promises, hey, all the land of Canaan will be yours. And not only that, a big blessing. You'll be a blessing to all nations. Now, what happens in the course of the history of the Bible is that, that promise to Abraham again and again comes under threat. But the answer we get today in our passage is that God's promise always stands. Let's quickly look at that, how it opens. Here is the way Exodus opens up for us. So we only have three points, really, and we'll be done with it. Verse 1 to 7. It's very easy if you check out your Bibles. Now in Exodus 1, verses 8 to 14, and then verses 15 to 22. The Bible opens by listing the names of the sons of Israel, or Jacob. Israel is the same man as Jacob. And he says, these are the names of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. And he goes on ahead to list 11 sons. And of course, verse 6, he says, uh, verse, uh, no, verse 5 is because Joseph was already in Egypt. I think the writer here wants us to go back to the story we finished with last time. To go back and remind ourselves, why is this man by the name Joseph? Why is he in Egypt? Of course, you remember that story. He was sold by his brothers into slavery. But the Lord was with him. He prospered him in Egypt. And in fact, in the end of the story, there was a lot of beauty in it because he was the one who rescued all his brothers. They were able to come. They were all rescued. There was famine in Canaan and also in Egypt that had threatened not only Egyptians but also the family of Jacob in Canaan. And we said last Sunday, which is very important, is that if the famine had swept the family of Jacob, then it is right to say, humanly speaking, that even Jesus Christ would not have come. And it's also right to say that you and I today will not be having hope. But the miracle that happened that time is that God used this particular evil act of the brothers wanting to kill his own brother because of his ambitions to actually rescue not only them at that particular time to actually even become a blessing to you today. You remember those words we read in Genesis 50, 20 where Joseph was addressing his brothers and he said, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about that in this day to save many people alive. He reminded them that the great purposes of God was even beyond them. And they could not be able to stop what God was doing. They thought they could stop one man who was dreaming. But actually, no. 
God had a bigger plan that was beyond them. And so what we, we see there is that not only was God actually interested in the 12 men, but actually God was thinking about the whole world at the time and even today. In fact, he goes on to tell us that if you thought these people are very, very, very important, what he says there in verses 7, no, no, verses 6, is that Joseph died. Who else died? All his brothers and all that generation. All that generation goes, but here is a big but I want you to see. Verses 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Can you see any echoes to Genesis? Can you remember those words of God to Abraham? That your own offspring will be as numerous as what? As the stars and as the seed on the seashore. seashore. I should avoid that word. Somebody give me a better word to use there. But what we can see here is, in a very small way, they are away in Egypt. God has already saved them through the famine. And now, what we are told in verse 7 is that those very people have now increased mightily. And they are doing very well, even though they are away from the land that God had promised them to give them. Which I think, a, a quick one, a quick application here I thought when I was preparing this, which gives us a broader picture of God. But God is not just in charge of one place, is it? When God was giving the promises to Abraham, he was in Canaan. And he could have as well said, I think God dwells in Canaan. But now they are in Egypt, away from home. But what we are told is that God was still with them there, multiplying them, fulfilling his promise, and making them as numerous. So that's so much we are told, almost very exaggerated language here, verse 7, that the land was filled with them. In other words, it's as if you can say God followed them to Egypt. Because God of Canaan is still God of Egypt. He's God everywhere. But it's also good for us to know this. God's promise is not bound by the boundaries of any space, of any place. He's not just God of one tribe. Sometimes people might go back to their tribes and say, we have the Agekoyo, um, uh, uh, you know, we have Agekoyo God, we have Ngai. Others might go back and say we have Enkai and other kind of gods. Here is a God of the Bible. He's not just God of a one people group. He's God of all. And he is not bound by any, any spheres of the earth. It is whom, as, as we were praying here, we say that the earth and everything belongs to him. God is big, friends. And I want you to say right from the beginning, that there is nothing special about the children of Israel. It's just an ordinary family. In fact, we saw last time that it is a very broken family. But what that makes them special is because God has chosen them. The almighty God who keeps his covenant and his promises had chosen their forefathers, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Now, he is with them. So that's the first thing that we see there. They are away in a foreign land, but what is happening to them is that they are multiplying, they are increasing, and they are growing exceedingly strong. But the party was not for so long. Look with me from verse 8. The party did not continue for so long because we are told in verses 8 that there arose a new king of Egypt who did not know Joseph. So Joseph was good. He was a good guy up there. He was known, but a new man came. Joseph had already died. You remember that first sentence there? And actually, verse 9, he says, men are always af afraid. He says, these guys have grown. They are too many, too mighty for us. Hey, come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Rest 
I want you to mark that sentence. Lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. They are now many. They are now becoming a threat to the king there. He's thinking these guys might as well just take over our country. And therefore, verse 11, here is a good method. Let us reduce their numbers. Okay? Let us keep them on check. You know that? It's unfortunate that actually these ones has happened in the history of the world. Of people as well just wanted to eliminate others for the sake of political gains and all that kind of things. Quite sad. May the Lord help us as we go to election here. But anyway, look at what they do, verse 11. They set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They, in fact, forced to build some store cities for Pharaoh, and we are told they are Pithon and Lamses. But, but, look at verse 12 with me. Are you there? Look at verse 12. What happens to them? The more they were opposed, the more they reduced in numbers and became very few. Is that the case? What happened to them? Let's read together. The more they were oppressed, Amen. Amen. What an amazing thing, is it? If you, if you have not started seeing what's happening in this particular story, I hope this, this again helps you. Verse 7, they are away in another country. What happens to them? They increase in numbers. These guys are afraid of them. They expose them to hard labor in verses 11. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. So Pharaoh is working on reducing numbers while God is actually multiplying their numbers. Now, in a normal condition, can I say that's not how to increase the population? Okay, if you are doubting, sometimes maybe hardship normally increases. No, it doesn't. If you want to increase the lifespan of people and reduce mortality rates, at least my actuarial science comes back here, what you do is that you give people conducive environment, is it? You, you pay them better. I'm sure that's what you are, you are hoping your employer would be reasoning uh, to my sermon. You pay them better. You give them good diet. You provide proper health care systems. Okay? Are you reasoning to me? Do you think I should apply for any position in the coming elections? I'm a ground in a summer in. But you get the point, is it? If you want people to multiply, what you do is that you provide good environment for them to do that. Now, because what happens with the hard labor like the one they were exposed to in Exodus is that some people will die out of hard work. Some of them will be killed by taskmasters because they can't be able to perform. They will die of, of hunger and other things there. But what we are told here a point that I think the narrator believed to be Moses is making here is it is God at work to fulfill his promises. It is God who is at work to make sure that truly that promises made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob are actually becoming true and possible. What can stop the promises of God from being fulfilled? Nothing. Not even a mighty king like Pharaoh, and we'll be seeing that in the next coming days even more. He cannot stop what God has designed that is going to happen. But here is the last thing, uh, at least for the last point there. So that, that method doesn't seem to, to succeed. They try all manner of things. In fact, they had making them to do hard work. They are told all kinds in the field. Ruthless, verse 14. They made them slaves, but the more they were oppressed, the more they increased. Then the king thought, hey, something is not right. I need to do something else. Perhaps he might have called the, the people who are experts. I need another, another method. Look at what he said in verse 15. 
He thought, go to the root of the problem. Okay, I want to deal with these people. They are growing very fast. I need to deal with them. Go to the root of the problem. Verse 15, he calls the midwives. And I promised you names. Here they are. Shipra and Pua. What a good name. I haven't come across somebody called like that. But here are the midwives. And he calls them. And he tells them in verse 16, look at this evil. How much, how much evil can you think about that men can do? Look at verse 16. He says, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the bar stool, if it is a son, what shall you do to him? You shall kill him. Can you imagine? And if it is a daughter, she shall leave. What a what an evil thing is it? Can you imagine? Imagine somebody in a maternity ward and they work there, they are waiting for the women to deliver. And as they see that it is a baby boy, their work, what, what Pharaoh is telling them, their work should be, I don't know, hold their neck or something and kill them. Now, the, the strategy is simple. If you want to deal, and especially even more so in those generation times, if you want to deal with people and kill them, if you finish all the male children, in the next 20 to 30 years, it means that even all the ladies who have been born will not have anybody among the Hebrews to be able to marry them. I wanted to see how it was going to work. If you wonder how is that a method that's going to work. So where will the girls be married to? Egyptians, exactly. They'll be married to Egyptians. And if they are married to the Egyptians, that is a gradual way of just doing away with this race called the Hebrews. What a terrible, terrible thing that has happened. Not a huge application, but may the Lord help us to hate abortion and in all its forms. When I was few as it's terrible, is it? It's perhaps no, it might have a different motive to it, but it's terrible. When people think that, you know, we will, we will actually decide who actually leaves and who doesn't leave. But anyway, look at what happens. You would be thinking, yeah, definitely he will succeed, is it? But verse 16. So the promise of God is under threat. But verse 16. No, sorry. Verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But what did they do? They let the male children to live. Now every time I read this passage, I'm sometimes surprised by we don't know much about these midways, by the way, from the biblical history and all that we have. We don't know. We don't know why even they feared God, actually. We don't know the reason they feared God. I may not even think that they were believers. I do not know. I do not even know. It just could have been the common grace of humanity. Maybe they thought, that's so cruel, we can't do that. We don't know. But what we are told here is that they feared God and they did not do as a king commanded. And with that, with that very little act of kindness from midwives, poor and shipra, they let the male children leave. Now I'm so tempted to apply this. I, I know we are in the electioneering period where we, we want the big guys up there to do things, is it? We want to Huru and Raida and Ruto, wherever it is, to finish corruption. But I wonder whether, in our own small ways, as the Lord has gifted us, as the Lord has called us, and perhaps serve as a, just a mere accountant in that particular company. Maybe you're not the big man in that company, I agree with you. But what are you doing? May the Lord help us, is it? All of us like complaining. We, I, I do. This cavern is not building roads properly. There are a lot of potholes. 
but I'm I'm the one who finds myself as an accountant. I have to pay people per DMs. And I forge somebody sits somewhere to actually get more. What a good example here. From women, I don't know whether they were believers, friends, and I must confess that. But they chose to fear God and not the king. Now, it's good for us to know that Pharaoh was a big man then, is it? To stand and to think, I will not obey this guy. I will do quite the opposite of what he is saying. Lead it. That's risking your life. That's really putting your life on the risk. Or perhaps losing their jobs. I don't know whether midwives were, how, how they were being paid then. But lead it. That's a risky thing. But they chose to fear God. And next week, because of that kind of fear, next week we'll be looking at the baby in the basket. That's a good story, is it? Next week. That's next week. Not today. But I want you to see how God was still working. Even then. So much so that now, because of that, look at verse 20. The midwives do not kill these babies. And they give, by the way, a very fake um, reason. I should have said that. Sorry. So they are called by Pharaoh, what's happening, guys? I send you on a job, you're not doing it. You have let these guys live in verses 18. In verse 19, they say, well, you know, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are very vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. We know that's not true, is it? <laughs> it's not that because the, midwife, the Hebrew women were so fast in giving birth. No, it is them who had feared God, we had just been told, and therefore they dealt uh, with the children differently. So we are told, verse 20, God dwelt with the midwives and he, uh, with them. And a good point, a big one there. And the people, let's read together, verse 20, part B. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. Now again, if you're asking, what's the big point here that we are seeing here? Look at that. Now this is the third time that in one chapter we are told the people of God grew multiplied and grew very strong. It is God, God's promise to Abraham that is being fulfilled. He is a God who keeps his promises. He is a God whose promises cannot be stopped by anything. Not famine, not the threat of hardship and slavery, and not even death can threaten them. What is was if we were Sometimes we fear death, don't we? You know, if somebody came here with a pistol and said, they can't. <laughs> you know, they can't your Christianity or I kill you. Now we are sometimes bold to say, no, even through death, even through death, I know that the Lord can be trusted. Those, those three men we like to, to look at in the book of Daniel. What was their names? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they, they are told to worship this idol. And they say, even if our God is able to save us, we will not bow to this God. Oh, how may I pray that the Lord may encourage us with those kind of people. But the other thing I want you to observe here is that deliverance, rescue, God's promises... That the deliverance is happening even before the Lord announces that he is delivering his people. So the whole chapter, God has not spoken. And it's good for you just to observe that in the Bible. I like that. In the whole chapter, God has not spoken to anyone. He has not come to Moses or even to children of Israel. He has not. They are just in the daily hustle and bustle of life. And can I say it, it should amaze us how God works in the normal day-to-day -day life. Now, sometimes God works in loud and visible ways. We are going to be seeing how he used to come and with great, you know, um, cause things even leave us to turn into brats. Sometimes that's a huge way that God works in miracles and all that. But sometimes God works in ordinary lives of believers. Have you experienced a miracle this week? You might think, no, come on, I haven't. But I want to say, no, God is at work in your life. Even in a very small way, ordinary ways that sometimes we don't even think God is at work. No, God is at work. Even when we can't see him. He was at work in using ordinary people like midwives. 
Even later on, we'll see pressure seeking Pharaoh's daughter who just goes on to bathe and is enjoying. And then, lo and behold, a baby Moses is out there. God works. And can I say we need to pause here and hear that again? Because we tend sometimes to want, I want to hear God. I want to hear the voice of God. I want to see God in my life. And I will say it is, sometimes God might come in your life, yes, in a big way. And sometimes people even post on their social media pages, God is faithful. <laughs> right? You're perhaps trusting God for a spouse and you get them. And we look at your status, God is faithful. And, and indeed, he has been kind to you. But can I say, sometimes just God works in ordinary ways, through ordinary people, in ordinary means. He doesn't always shout. We don't always see him. Sometimes we cannot even pin a finger that this is God who is at work. But he works. He is at work. He is alive. He is at work even this day, as you hear his word today. Hey, we may not have a deliverance service after this. And we, you, we, you may not have you rolled down and all that. But this is something I can assure you. God is at work in your life. And his promises are always yes and amen. And I, I dare say this, that he's not only at work when things are good, when there's a pay rise at the job, when I'm getting a marriage partner. He's not only good when I'm getting a child. No. Even when there is slavery, like you can see in this story, even when there is hardship and bitterness, even when there is a tyrant like Pharaoh, God is still at work. And may the Lord help you to hear that. Now can I say that this sounds like a beautiful story, of course, that we are learning, and encouraging about God keeping his promises. But let me, let me very quickly show you the happy ending of this story. Because this story is not just for Israelites alone. It also includes you and me. I'll read this in the interest of time. Galatians 3.16. Here's what Paul says in Galatians 3.16. He says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. What Paul is helping us here even to make more sense of this particular story is saying that this story is just an episode of a greater story. It is just a shadow of an even greater fulfillment of that promise to Abraham, which is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. That of blessing all the nations, the one of the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, one through whom the blessings goes beyond one nation to all nations. He says, hey, that promise to Abraham was referring to Jesus Christ. Remember that old Sunday school song, Father Abraham? Shall we sing it for those who are sleeping? Father Abraham. Amen. That Father Abraham had many sons, is it? Have you already seen them? Yes. And by the way, I don't think there is anybody here called Shadrach. Is there anyone? No. But you know what? What we are told there is that I am one of them. I am one of those sons. Now, how am I one of the sons of Abraham? It is through Christ Jesus. To whom this promise is actually fulfilled. So this morning, we, we celebrate God for two things. One, that he is a God who keeps promises like he did. And surely we can go back and see how he has done it to Israelites. But we can also rejoice that actually... We are beneficiary of those promises through Christ. 
But all who have trusted in Christ Jesus this morning for the forgiveness of their sins and hope for this life and the one to come are actually children of Abraham, people who have received the promise. So here is a question. What is going to give courage and boldness to Israelites as they prepare to enter the promised land? Here is the answer. It's by looking back at how God has acted in the past to fulfill his promise. And they can say he is a God who fulfills his promises. You see, everyone who is a believer today here in the morning listening to me, there's a sense in which we relate to this story. We are not yet there. These guys were in slavery. Surely they are not yet in Canaan and will come to that. But this one thing they can hold on. The God who has fulfilled his promise, he will keep us up to the very end. And the same for us, is it? You can say here we have been saved, redeemed, delivered. We are those who are saved and waiting. We are waiting for Christ's second coming. But suffering, illnesses, tears, short-lived joy, mourning is perhaps the mark of our life. And as I speak this morning, it's possible there is somebody here who is listening to me is wondering, where is God? Come out. Where is this God who keeps his promises? I feel like I'm just thrown under the bus. Nothing seems to be working on my end. Paul says this in, in Romans. He says, you know, we, we, we groan, we wait in eagerness for adoption of our bodies. For this hope, we were saved. But here is a reason to hold on, to trust, to be firm, to trust in God's promises because he will keep his promises. He will not fail. And nothing, nothing will make him to fail. Here is a reason to hold on to Christ. In that threat, even in that pain sometimes of being bedridden, I do not know how each of us will come to the end of your life. I don't know. But even then we can hold on because God will keep his promises. And the question is, who shall stop God from fulfilling his promises? No one. Did you see that? No one. Not Pharaoh, not famine, not death, nothing. But here's, a, here's how Paul asked that question in Romans. He asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes on to give an answer. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to add there and say, not even generational curses or witchcraft will actually separate us from the love of God. Nothing will do that. No threat to you, believer. Sorry, I need to, I need to say this. And sometimes I preach like I am doing this this morning and I, I hit that gate and sometimes the fears of life creep in back to me. And I go back to doubting God's promises. And one of the prayers I'm constantly praying for myself, and I thought it's good to tell you to pray for yourself, is to pray the Lord will help you to overcome your unbelief. To believe in God's promises. You see, unbelief is sort of the root of all our sin. It's unbelief. Because, see, here is a unique thing about Christianity. It is founded and anchored on what he has promised, not in a your own capability. It is founded on what he has done, not on what you can do. It is founded on his ability to keep his word, not on your ability to keep your word. You see, our hope is not in ourselves. It is in our Redeemer. Our confidence is not in our good works. It is in him, Jesus Christ. And I love that song we're going to be singing after this. That he will hold you fast to the very end. You see, we are not the ones who are holding to Jesus Christ. He is the one who is holding to us. That's why we can fight sin, by the way, with confidence. And that's why we can know that we will win at the end of the day. Yes, 
the last illustration somebody showed me. He told me, sometimes as believers we think we are the ones who are holding God. Are you with me? And sometimes we keep on worrying. What if I get tired and release God? What will happen to me? What if I got weak? What if sin that is crippling me actually overcomes me and sweeps me across and away? But here is what he helped me. He told me, you're not the one who is holding Jesus Christ. He is the one who is holding you. And you know what? He will not let go. He will hold you to the very end. He is trustworthy. He will keep his promises. And we can trust him. Why don't you take a minute and just reflect on that? Just take a minute. Think about that. Pray for yourself especially. That you will trust his promises. And after that, James will come to finish the prayer for us. And to take us from there. we pray for ourselves just to, I just thought when Pastor Peter was preaching um, what do we think is the biggest hindrance to God's promises is it death it doesn't look like think about the greatest world leader you can think about neither of his kings can actually thwart God's promises. Pharaoh was a big guy. Think about of his achievement in Egypt, the pyramids we see today. But he was no match to God and his promises. And sometimes we, I was just thinking, we get occupied with the big things of life, the things that people are doing, you know, the leaders that are out there, and maybe they steal our hearts, and we think that is better than what God has to offer. But you know what? They are no much to us who hold on to God's promises and be reminded that we can trust Him and us and His word that He has given to us. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that you help our hearts when you have doubted your words. When the enemy or our own sinfulness or even the world entices us so much that we think it's more glamorous than the promises you have for us, please forgive us. Please forgive us when we have acted either in our businesses, in our ministry circles, in our homes, in our friendships, and made decisions that show we indeed don't trust your word and you for who you are. And we pray as your word comes to us this morning from Exodus, as we go on to see how you have promised and you're bringing to fulfillment, and nothing can thwart your purposes and your plan for the world. We pray that our hearts will be captured by this truth. That as we begin tomorrow, Lord, and as we go out of this gate, we'll be those who seek in small and big ways, in the ordinariness of life, to trust you, to trust you in our decision making, to trust you in everyday circumstances to know that your promises are true, even when our circumstances don't seem to say the same. That the, your promises go beyond hardships and circumstances that you may never understand. Probably even hard workplaces 
that sometimes look like this slavery or oppression. Lord, we pray that we know your promises for us, for an eternity with you, as your children are never thwarted by circumstances. So give us a heart that looks up to you. Give us a heart that is reminded every now and then that you are indeed in control and the world powers, whatever they are, not Russia, not the US, not the European Union, not a united Africa can stand against a powerful God. Not even a looming election in our country can thwart your purposes and plans for your people. Help us to, to see how big you are, how in control of our own lives you are, and not be distracted by the world, the devil, or our own sinfulness. For this we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen.